Well, hello and welcome to today's Bible class. Uh, appreciate you taking time to join in. Let's, let's say a prayer. Our God, we're thankful that we have the opportunity to dive into your word, Father, and try to discern the great truths which have been shared with us. We pray that what we discover today will be of great benefit to us in our Christian endeavor. Forgive us when we fail you. Love us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, we're going to continue on uh, with uh, our study in the book of uh, 1 Peter today. Uh, last week we got from, uh, the first, from the first chapter, the first verse, to about the ninth verse. Uh, and this week we'll pick up uh, in, uh, uh, chapter, in chapter 1, verse, verse 10, and then continue on and finish out the first chapter. Uh, there's a there's an awful lot in these particular chapters, so we don't want to we don't want to rush too much uh, to uh, to make sure we get everything covered. So to to begin with to begin with with verse ten, we want to back up just one verse because it kind of sets the tone for what uh, for what Peter's talking about there. So let's let's pick up in verse nine, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. So. What he what we all talked about last week, and, and what Peter was talking about was all of these different things that we do as a result of our faith. Uh, the outcome of that, the the eventual ending of all that, is salvation, heaven. And uh, so he, he's kind of he's kind of setting the tone there uh, for the next. And then in verse ten, he's he's kind of continuing that thought uh, about salvation. So let's pick up in verse ten. As to this salvation. The prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries. Now, one of the great truths that we're going to learn here is the fact that the Holy Spirit was dwelling in these prophets, and as they were making these prophecies about the about the the coming Savior, uh, they didn't understand what, even what they were writing, what they were saying. Because it was the Holy Spirit in this particular case is speaking through them, uh, and so I think the idea that Peter is going to be trying to reach in the next few verses, really up down through about uh, verse twelve or so at least, uh, is the idea that here are these prophets who were making these prophecies, and then they would come back and study in depth, trying to understand it with more clarity and, and have a, have more of an appreciation of, of what it is that they were actually prophesying. Uh, so that's the, that's the kind of the idea that he's setting. So they would prophesy it, write it, and then go back and study it and try to understand it with more clarity. That's, that's the idea. And, and it continues on in verse 11. Seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ... and the person or time would be that they were that they were prophesying about was Jesus, they're the Messiah, and when he was going to be coming, and what were going to be the events leading up to his coming, and those are things that that were being prophesied about by them, but they were going back and having to study to try to discern more and more depth about it. But I love what they what the, what he what he says here in the middle of this verse. He talks about the Spirit of Christ now. Paul also uses this idea of the Spirit of Christ. That's the Holy Spirit. Uh, we have we've had the Holy Spirit referred to in different manners throughout Scripture. We'll have Him referred to as the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of Christ. I think that helps us understand a little bit of the unity between the the Godhead. Uh, is this something that we can probably grasp? I don't know. Uh, some things about God we we can't understand. Uh, as we are just carnal, we are we are we are we are man. Uh, we don't understand the spiritual things, uh, and this this may be one of them. But again, in my mind, this just kind of helps us with with some of the 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 concepts of the unity of the of the Holy Spirit. But listen to what he says: seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, within them. I mean, we all understand that. Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the New Testament is written, uh, and we have a lot of clarity on on how that how all, all that transpired and how it could be passed on. The gift of the Holy Spirit that we get at baptism, we really try to study a lot on this. But these are verses that help us clearly understand that prior to the New Testament, the Old Testament writers were also inspired by the Spirit. And I mean, it, it, it tells us here in this particular passage, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of the Christ and the glories to follow. So 
predicted there is prophesied. He, he the Holy Spirit, prophesied about Jesus coming and, and the things that Jesus would have, would have to endure. Uh, listen to verse 12 then. It was revealed to them, and, and that them is the prophets who were prophesying in the Old Testament. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. And you was the, the Christians of that day, and us also. Uh, not serving themselves, but you in these things which have now been announced to you through those who have preached the gospel to you. And so basically Peter is saying these prophets were trying to understand the things that were, were now being shared with Christians who are, who are being preached to them about the gospel of Christ. Uh, and from the past, they were trying to look forward and understand and, and, and discern when is these things going to happen, who is it going to be. Uh, just, just, just some great insight there. Have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you, by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. So the Holy Spirit being influential, uh, that, that being the same as the Spirit of Christ, same as the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Uh, the influence that He has uh, in the, the both the original and the current day, laying out of the truth, laying out of the message of Christ. Uh, very powerful scripture. And I think, again, what, what is Peter trying to, to do here? He's trying to give an impression to them and to us as modern day Christians the beauty of what we possess, the beauty of the Word, the beauty of the, the gift of Jesus, the beauty of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the, the beauty of forgiveness, all of these things we have that they didn't have but they, that they wanted. Uh, and then he kind of takes it one step further, and I really appreciate what he's doing here. Listen to what he says at the very end of verse 12. Things into which angels long to look. Isn't that an interesting passage? So talking about first the prophets who were trying to understand what we have, angels who are trying to appreciate what we have, and it kind of gives the idea that they were they were peering in, stooping in, looking looking at what we have. Uh, turn turn back to Hebrews the first chapter. Turn back to Hebrews the first chapter. If, for those of you that had an opportunity to study Hebrews in depth, one of the things that, that the Hebrew writer does is, tr is, is trying to, to prove that Jesus is better than several things. He's better than Moses. He's better than the angels. He's better high priest. He brings a better covenant. He brings better sacrifices. All these things are better. One of them being better than the angels. And as he's going through this, this, this justification... Listen to, listen to some of the things that he said because they're, they're very important to help us understand the relationship between God and angels and the relationship between angels and man. It, it's very unique. Listen to what he says in, in the first, ver, first chapter of Hebrews, the 14th verse, talking about angels. And he says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? Those who will inherit salvation... Or us. What is inferred by that particular passage is that they themselves do not have this opportunity. So once they sin and are cast out, there is no mechanism for Jesus' blood to cleanse and bring them back in. So it's, it's very interesting. He then he further, and further uh, clarifies that uh, passage in uh, the second chapter of Hebrews, the 16th verse, and li listen to what he says. Because, again, this is important for us to understand. As Peter's talking about these angels trying to understand and, and learn themselves about what we have, salvation. Listen to what, listen to what the Hebrew writer said in verse, chapter 2, verse 16. But assuredly, He, God, but assuredly, He does not give help to angels, but He gives help to the descendants of Abraham. Uh, Again, Peter's, Peter's argument in this is think about the beauty of what we have been given as Christians, uh, as followers of Jesus, as the saved who have been promised salvation. Even the prophets of old were, were yearning to look for it. Even the angels are yearning to look for it. I, it's just a very powerful and very meant to be encouraging piece of scripture uh, to, to say to them, Christians uh, in the first century, and to us all these years later, wow. What you've been given is, is extraordinary. Uh, so he continues on in verse 13. Therefore, kind of uh, summarizing, I guess you would say, about what he's been preaching there. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Now, 
The King James says, gird up your loins. Uh, I, I like the poetry sometimes of the King James Version, but, but the idea is the same. Prepare yourself. Uh, both we prepare our, our, ourself, our, prepare our mind through, through prayer, through meditation, through reflection on God's Word. Prepare yourself for action. Keep sober in the Spirit. Fix your hope completely upon the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that, that's a wonderful passage that, that, that Peter's sharing with us there. The, the idea that what we have is a gift. Uh, it is unmerited favor from God. Uh, that, and, and it was revealed to us when by Him sending Jesus, uh, the Savior, the Messiah, the Lamb. That, that's the idea of what He's trying to share with us in that particular passage. Verse 14, as obedient children. Now, it is difficult to express the importance of obedience in New Testament theology. Uh, all things that we, that, that, we, that we do in relationship to, to our in perspective to our relationship with God is important. Faith is important. But obedience is equally, or works, the, those things are equally important and, and work together in unison. James taught us that. Uh, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. Now, many of us, and in particular in my case, have been a Christian my whole life. Uh, it's sometimes hard to even think back to the way I was before I became a Christian. Uh, we certainly all sin and we certainly all kind of slip back, but Peter's encouragement here is to these people who, who had just recently become Christians, don't turn your back and become the way you were. Don't, don't conform to the world. Uh, do not be conformed to the former lusts, which lust was what, whether it's, whether it's greed, whether it's envy, whether it's some kind of physical lust. Don't go back to, the, to being that way. Verse 15, but like the Holy One who called you, and the Holy One is God. And the, the passage that he's going to, or the, the, the piece of uh, prophecy that he's going to share with his comes from Leviticus, and in, the, in that book, uh, God said this five different times, and so it's, it's a very important piece. He said, he said, but verse 15, <clears throat> I'm sorry, but 16, because it is written, you are to be holy as I am holy. Uh, let's back up and reread verse 15, because I want to make sure we, we get the emphasis there. But the Holy One who calls you, be holy yourselves also in your own behavior. You know, if you, if you go back to the fifth chapter of, of Matthew, right in the middle of the, the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, as, we, as we, it's commonly referred to, the, the last verse, uh, which is verse 48 in the fifth chapter of Matthew, Jesus is kind of summarizing a point he made, and he really sets an incredibly difficult bar for us. He says, you are to be holy, or you are to be perfect, as your God, as God the Father is perfect. <laughs> I mean, that just kind of redefines everything about Christianity, the, the standard by which we are expected to attain. It, it is not to, to be going back to the way we were. It is to be is to continually being able to elevate our faith, elevate our obedience, elevate everything about our Christian walk to be more like God. Uh, just such a such a powerful standard. And then he reiterates that in verse 16, because it is written, ye shall be holy, for I am holy. That's God speaking again. It comes from Leviticus, and he said it five times in that particular book. So something that God feels very strongly about. He, he sets a standard for us to, to, to adhere to, to strive for, that is exceptional. Be like God. <laughs> wow. So, continue on in verse 17. As you address the Father... Or I'm sorry, if you address the Father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work. Now that's, that's an important concept that we get. Uh, that, you know, when, when, let, me, let me preface it by saying this. Back when we, when we studied the book of James uh, uh, in this series of lessons, it was, oh, a few years back. Uh, one of the things that we would ask each time before we, uh, before we, began a study is, is we, would, we would ask, does faith save you? And the answer is yes. And then we follow that up immediately, do work save you? Yes, it, it takes both of those, work in unison. And 
to, to have the idea that all I must do is just believe and all I must do is just accept Jesus into my heart, that is in some part true. But it is also true that now that I am a Christian, I must have works. I must be doing the things that Jesus said. I must be obedient to the truths that He has prescribed. And, and this is one of, of those that helps us appreciate and understand that. Because listen to what He says. If you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work. You hear that? It's not just our initial faith. It's how we continue to live throughout our lives that we are going to be judged upon. That's, that is an important principle that, that Peter is sharing with here. Uh, if, you go, if you go back and read Romans chapter 2, verse 6, Paul uses the exact same teaching that God will judge those uh, based, on our, based on our actions. Uh, so, very powerful, powerful passage. Conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. Now, one of the things that we don't want to do as Christians, and, and I think the New Testament writers help us appreciate this, is go through a, go through our lives with the with a with a fear that that we're we're not going to be saved because of a single sin. You know that I'm going to uh, be in a good standing with God. I'm going to commit a sin and die, and I'm not going to be saved. And, and that that's not the idea that we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is a perpetual respect, a godly respect. For the Father, and the word that, that Peter's using here is is fear. Uh, God, uh, back in Luke, Jesus said, "Don't fear the one who can kill your earthly body. Fear the one who can kill your soul and, and condemn you to heaven or and condemn you to hell." The Father. That's the idea. A, a, a healthy respect, godly respect for the Father. That's the idea. Conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay here on the earth. So. All of our walk is, is to continually be in awe and respect and fear of, of, the, of the Father and, and what, he, what He could do if we are not faithful, if we are not obedient to the truths given here. Such a powerful piece of Scripture here. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like gold or silver from your futile ways of life inherited from your forefathers. Now, this is kind of a theme that, that Peter has used. He's used it a little bit earlier. He's going to use it a little bit later. But the idea that, that the things that we can accumulate here in this world are really of no value. Gold and silver and land and possessions. Th those are not the things which define our relationship with the Father. They're perishable. Uh, and if, if, if we put our faith in those, we will fail uh, from, a, from the perspective of salvation. So, so, so listen to what he says. Honey. Let's, let's, let's reread that again. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like gold or silver from the futile way of life inherited from your fathers, but, and, and then he kind of gives a contrast here, you weren't, you're not saved by these things. This is what you're saved by. So he picks up in verse 19. But with precious blood, as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Uh, to, it is impossible to put enough emphasis on the importance of the cleansing power of Jesus' blood in perspective to our sin. Because in the end, that's all that really matters. You know, we are here on this world for just a short period of time. Eternity lasts forever. The only way that we get from where we are to the presence of God is through the blood of Jesus. And, and I think that's what Peter's trying to, to share with us here, the importance of, of, the, of, of the grace of God, the unmerited favor, and the importance of giving Jesus for Him to sacrifice His blood in order for us to have the opportunity to, to redeem ourselves to God. Uh, that is the idea that, he, that he's talking about. Silver and gold, they don't do it. Jesus' blood is the only thing. Uh, again, I love how Peter is giving us just some of the most important, fundamental teachings about about the Christian salvation, uh, and they're just they're just really wrapped up in these first couple of chapters. So let's continue on, verse twenty. For he was foreknown, Jesus. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. Again, we, we get little hints of this. You know, if, if you if you go back. To Genesis chapter one verse one. So let, let's let's think, let's think about that. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was out form and void, and darkness was on the face of the earth. And the Spirit of God hovered above the water. Okay. 
in that particular verse, we're really just introduced to God and the Spirit. Throughout the New Testament specifically, we are finally beginning to get exposed to the fact Jesus was also there. And, and this is one of the principal places. So we had God there, we had the Spirit there, and Jesus was there. Because, again, listen to that. He said, For He, Jesus, we're just talking about His blood, for He was foreknown before the foundation of the world. He was there. But He appeared in these last times, and that would be His advent, when He, when he came to the earth to die for us. So He's always been there with God. He's, he's, he's timeless. He always has been, He is, and He always will be. But He appeared to us. He was manifested to us during His time on the earth. And that's the idea that, that, that Peter's giving here. But He has appeared to you in these last times for the sake of you. And, and again, Peter's again trying to really encourage them and us about the importance of, of, of why it was necessary for Jesus to come. Uh, so let's continue on. For through Him, Jesus, for through Him are believers in God who raised Him from the dead. And he's talking about we are believers and God is the one who raised Him from the dead and gave Him the glory. Again, we, we've talked about this in, in many classes before. The fact that Jesus came to the earth and died makes Him no different than us. What makes Jesus different? What makes, what makes His life significant is the fact that through the Father, he lived again. He was raised. He defeated death. I mean, that is the important piece that, that, it, that is given to us here. And, and, and Peter is just kind of articulating that and making sure that we understand that. For who through Him are believers in God who raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory. He glorified the Savior. He made Jesus the Redeemer. The, the one who, who could save sin, the one who did save, save us from sin and wash our sins away. He glorified Him, gave Him the glory. Why? So that your faith and hope are in God. And again, it's, it's, it's the opportunity for us to be reconciled back with the Father. Sin separates us. There's this chasm. We, we can't overcome that. The only bridge to that chasm is the blood of Jesus. That's the idea that Peter is trying to give here. So we'll continue on in verse 23. I'm sorry, in verse 22. Since you have in obedience to truth, again, there's that, there's that concept. The, it's not just about your faith. It's also about works. It's also about the obedience that you, you, you do to follow the teachings of the follow the truth that's been given to us. Since you have in obedience to truth, Purified your souls. Now that's an interesting that's an interesting concept. What we're going to find out in the next verse is this idea of how we purify our souls is through baptism. It is it is through the the second birth. The it is through the the entering into a watery grave and being arisen anew. That's that's the purification that he's talking about. And again, he'll we'll, he'll clarify that in the next verse. But since you have an obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren. One of our holy purposes given to us as Christians is to each other, to fellow members of the church, fellow brethren, fellow saints, as, as Peter will later, as later, later share with us. And, and here he, he's really trying to, to make us appreciate and give us an understanding that that is a very extraordinary purpose that, that we have been called. And again, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren. Fervently love one another from the heart. I mean, it's such an important purpose that, that we have. Now let's continue on in verse 23 because this is, again, the emphasis is, put, is pushing back to this purified that we just talked about. For you have been born again. You hear that? You have been... And, and, and I remember in, in the Gospels when, when Jesus was asked, when, when Jesus was beginning to share this idea of being born again, it was very perplexing to him. How could we again enter into our mother's womb? And he helped them understand, not physical, it's spiritual. You are, you are spiritually born again. You die to your old self and rise again to a new man or woman. That, that's the concept that he's given here. That is how we are purified. And, and so, for verse 23, For you have been born again, 
not of seed which is imperishable, kind of going back to the same idea that, that he's been talking about, not something that can be taken away or stolen or lost, perishable. Not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring Word of God. Uh, you know, there are some that would proclaim that the Word of God is not complete. We need, we need someone to come along and help and help illuminate it or help to add to it. It's perfect. It's exactly the way it is. It, it, it is living and it is capable and it is independent of everything else. God's Word is God's Word. And it is timeless forever. And then at this point, Peter is going to quote a a particular piece of passage from Isaiah. It's quoted several times in the New Testament, but it's 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 to it's to, again to emphasize this idea that that God's word is eternal. So let's listen to that. Let's pick up at verse twenty four four. Again, this comes from Isaiah the fourth chapter, verses six through eight. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls off. But listen to this in verse twenty five. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, that, that is Peter telling it and then using a, a teaching from the old prophecies of Isaiah to reinforce it, that God's Word is eternal. And it is sufficient. Uh, and then he, and he wraps it up. And this is the Word which was preached to you. Uh, again, meant to encourage, meant to strengthen, meant to give an appreciation for what we have in respect to salvation because of Jesus. The angels didn't have it. The prophets did, had, they couldn't participate in it. Now, we learned a lot about that in other, in other uh, chapters of the New Testament, specifically Romans. Uh, but Peter's just trying to, to, to give an appreciation to us as Christians. Wow, what you have is just exceptional. You have, you have the Word. You have salvation. You have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You have forgiveness. All of these things because of Jesus. Uh, such, a, such a powerful piece of Scripture. So let's wrap it up there. Let's stop. Uh, we'll pick up in, uh, in uh, the second chapter, uh, verses, uh, verse chapter, second chapter, verse 1 next week uh, in our lesson. Uh, let's close with a prayer. Our God, we're thankful. We're thankful for the opportunity to really dive into your word and understand the the doctrine and understand the theology that that you have shared with us peter helped me clarify that uh, even more for us as christians and and trying to give us an appreciation for what we have because of jesus uh, what we have because of the sacrifice and the plan that you came up with and the sacrifice that jesus made all of this is a gift which previous generations did not have and we're, we're grateful for these teachings. We pray that you'll bless each of us. We pray that you'll bless your church. When we fail you, forgive us. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.